Education Series. Um, as you remember this, uh, let me introduce myself, I'm Chris Anderson, I'm a fisheries economist here on the faculty in SAFS. Um, and as you recall, this, this uh, quarter's Bevan Series is organized around a series of themes or controversies that we've identified in uh, fisheries, uh, fisheries management. And uh, today we're starting sort of the next chapter, moving away from protected areas and beginning to talk about allocation. Here in SAFS, we spend a lot of time thinking about how much fish can we catch, what is a, a responsible way to catch it from an ecosystem perspective, and we spend relatively little time <clears throat> thinking about who gets to have it. But it turns out that that matters a tremendous amount. Downtown this week, they're talking about the allocation of halibut and whether it should be used to as, as bycatch to support the harvest of other species by uh, an industrial ground fishing fleet in the Bering Sea, or it should be caught by people who are uh, small fishermen and live in vulnerable communities in Alaska. Um, the next two talks are going to focus on the allocation of fish between the recreational sector and the commercial sector. And of course, the benefits that accrue are very, very different. Um, our first speaker is uh, Brad Gentner, who's come out to us from uh, Maryland. He got his uh, bachelor's degree from Northern Arizona in forestry. He did a master's in agricultural and natural resource economics down the road here at Oregon State. Um, and then he was hired by NIMS headquarters in Silver Spring. And he tooled up there with some PhD economics courses at the University of Maryland. And in, his, in uh, headquarters, he chaired the National Economic, Ec Economic Impact Working Group, which measures the contribution of, of uh, commercial and recreational fishing to the U.S. economy um, and to employment in the United States. And uh, perhaps most importantly to what we're going to talk about this week, he designed and ran the National Survey of Recreational Anglers. He became so familiar with this data and how to analyze it well that he found it was a better deal to go private. Somehow that paid better than working for the government. Um, so since 2007, he's been the president and the chief economist at the Gentner Group. Um, they do economic impact work, non-market valuation, and recreational user demand with a particular emphasis on recreational fishing. He stayed engaged with science, though, and has over 20 peer-reviewed publications and many, many more analyses and reports that have supported or guided fishing policy um, and management. So please welcome Brad Gettner. Uh, so I speak to a lot of different groups. Um, I know you're not all economists, and so I, I hope I've, I've, I've aimed this presentation correctly. I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time um, going over some concepts to sort of introduce what I want to talk about and sort of the issues and problems currently facing uh, intersectoral allocation, that is the allocation between two different sectors, primarily recreational and commercial fisheries, but it's applicable to any sort of sector, whether it's sort of subsistence or industrial or, or whatever. Uh, and I also want to tell you that uh, I'm not from Maryland. Um, I recently relocated to Arizona, and it is a tough pull to get me up here in February, I'm going to have to tell you. Uh, it's cold and wet. Uh, not real happy about that, frankly. I could be riding my motorcycle with shorts on. So what is economics? Uh, economics is the science of uh, human behavior in the face of trade-offs and, and, and giving advice about how to make those trade-offs. Uh, how does one person, a business, or society allocate scarce resources for the greatest good? Uh, well, we're gonna, I'm going to introduce some terms here. And you know, what we want to try to do is maximize the value uh, of this public resource to the owners of that public resource. And the owners of the public resource are all of us. Every single one of us has a stake in the fishery resource. And seeing that it's managed to the maximum value uh, of our society. Um, and there's sort of three concepts, or, or two concepts, that lead into sort of total value. Uh, is generally producer surplus plus consumer surplus. Uh, producer surplus is for business, consumer surplus is for individuals. You add those things together, and that's total value uh, of a resource. 
So we want to talk about you know, what are positive and normative metrics. And I introduced this concept because you see a lot of advocacy groups on either side of the fence toss around economic impacts and say, you know, we produce more jobs, so we deserve more fish. That's not the metrics you should be using. And that's why we're going to talk about value. And I give sort of a brief introduction to that. A normative metric is a metric that answers the question, is society better or worse off? Uh, makes a judgment. Economic value is one of those metrics. You know if it's got higher value, it's better. If it has lower value, it's worse. Uh, positive metrics are just measures of states of nature, uh, like temperature. You know, 60 degrees may be ideal for me, and I may think that's a beautiful temperature to be at. Someone else may think that's too cold. Someone else may think that's too warm. So just the number 60 is, is a positive metric. It doesn't tell us anything. Uh, it's just a measurement. Economic impacts are that sort of measurement. Um, I like to use an example really quickly uh, about why you don't use economic impacts, why positive metrics are the wrong things to be looking at when you're talking about allocation. And I like to use hurricanes. Uh, from a value standpoint, a hurricane, a big major hurricane destroying lots of property, uh, maybe taking lives, that's a huge value loss for society. We don't need a study to tell us that. The magnitude we would, but we can say straight away that's, that's a negative thing, that is not good for society. However, if you were look, uh, to look at economic impacts, You'd see immediately uh, after a storm, you know, all the Home Depots sell out of plywood. Every bulldozer operator in a five-state area is fully employed in, in Florida, let's say, after a hurricane. And, so, and that generates tons of positive, huge economic impacts. Lots of activity, lots of jobs. And so if we use economic impacts to judge whether or not hurricanes were a good thing for society, we'd be like, yeah, bring on the hurricanes. Uh, they're great employment generators. So you know, that's one thing you want to be careful of. And I'm not going to talk about that much anymore, but this is just to justify the use of value when looking at allocation. And so what, is, what are these components of value I talked about? Uh, so here's a supply and demand curve. Uh, of course, you weren't going to get away from the supply and demand curve. You knew that, right? You come in to hear economists talk. So uh, here's supply, here's demand. This yellow shaded triangle is producer surplus. I start with explaining producer surplus because it is the easiest concept for people to wrap their head around. It's essentially a business's profit. It's what they get to take home uh, above and beyond the cost of producing that good or service. That's producer surplus. That's the value to a business of whatever good this is. Let's call this good fishing. Uh, consumer surplus is the consumer's willingness to pay above and beyond what they paid to obtain a good or a service. And so, it's a little bit strange of a concept to think of. What do you mean what I'd be willing to pay above and beyond what I paid? Well, if you sort of, I like to think of it as a consumer's profit. It's, it's what you get to keep in your pocket after producing utility or producing enjoyment. You had to pay so much for that tube of toothpaste, but you'd be willing to give so much more for it, and that's the value that toothpaste has in your life. And so that, in a nutshell, is consumer surplus and producer surplus, and the total of these two, when we're talking about aggregate demand and supply, is the total value of society of producing this level of whatever this good is, let's say fishing trips, at this price. So to an economist, every decision is an allocation decision. Um, you know, particularly in fisheries, you know, everything we do is allocating this resource to this use or that same resource to another use. Um, and I, you know, if nothing else you get from this lecture, as you go forward in your fishery management career, I'd like you to think about that when you make decisions about conservation, setting a bag limit, setting a season length, setting a tack. You're making an allocative trade-off. You're either allocating more fish to the future or to conservation, or you're allocating more fish to harvest. And you can use these same techniques I'm going to show you for the allocation between sectors to think about that uh, issue and to think about how to use economics and how to use behavior in your fishery management career that lies ahead of you. Um, so generally, markets make allocation decisions very efficiently. Uh, and why we're even talking about this is because there are no markets for public goods, generally. Uh, markets set prices in quantity where supply and demand intersect. They make this decision about quantities clearing in the market at a given price where the value to the consumer is no higher or lower for that next unit of the good than it is to the value of the producer. So you're, you're setting the situation where they both agree to the price and quantity being sold. Um, and that just happens. You know, we don't have any, we don't have any uh, person sitting on high deciding the price of a product in a grocery store, or what you pay for something. It just sort of works out. Um, but what do we do when there are no markets? 
you know, we're dealing with a public good that's not traded in a market um, generally. Um, particularly recreational fishing, you can't just walk into a store and say, I'll take one recreational fishing trip, please. Uh, it's, a, it's a component of a bunch of different goods and a bunch of different services, all rolled into one. But it doesn't mean you can't allocate, and it doesn't mean you don't make these sort of allocative decisions. Uh, it just means you have to simulate a market. You have to sort of design something with your data and your analysis that puts you on that same footing. And that same footing is the equal marginal principle. And it's going to sound a lot like what I just quoted from our market. It's the value is maximized in this transaction where the value of the next unit of the good is the same for each sector. So the, you, know, you want to set it where that marginal value, that next fish or the next pound of fish, is the same for the commercial guys as it is for the recreational guys. There was some mechanism to allow them to trade uh, a price for the dockside value of fish and the recreational value of fish, then that allocation would set itself. Uh, so this sounds very similar to where we were with the market equilibrium. So ideally, this is what like, we'd like to see in, in an al allocation analysis. And what we have here is essentially two quota demand functions. The red one is a recreational allocation. It's essentially, they're both sort of upward sloping. Uh, well, it's, anyway, so we, what we have here is, is dollars on one side and the percent allocation on the top and the percent allocation on the bottom. And so what you're seeing is the, the rec curve should be downward sloping. Uh, the, the commercial curve would be uh, downward sloping as well, but we've sort of turned it upside down. And so where these two curves intersect would be the optimal allocation. Um, so this is saying for in this particular hypothetical fishery, uh, we trace out the locus of, of the demand for quota for rec guys and, and, and the demand for quota for commercial guys, and we come up with an allocation that would be roughly 75% recreational, 25% commercial. We don't know where we started in this fishery. I just wanted to explain the equal marginal principle. And so how do you, dis how do you design these? How do you come up with these slides? And that's sort of, or, or this, this graph or this analysis, that's sort of the crux of what I'm, the rest of what I'm going to talk about. It's the, it's the contention and the fight that's gone on about what the science is. And, and that's thus the title of my uh, presentation is, is currently I feel like we're letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, we make a lot of decisions in an uncertain environment. We take science with tons of uncertainty around it and make decisions about it. And currently, right now, we're letting the uncertainty surrounding these estimates stop us uh, from making allocative decisions. Um, and these types of graphs are very data, uh, these types of analyses are very data in intensive. Um, commercial cost and earnings data is needed on the commercial side, which isn't al always available. And if it isn't available, it's expensive and difficult to obtain. Unless you have a catch share fishery, it's very easy to obtain for a catch share fishery uh, because it's simply the quota lease rate. Um, and on the recreational side, we need data on the extensive margin. We need data on the budget of trip taking an individual angler would do throughout a year, which is very difficult to get from observed data. So often we resort to um, choice experiments to gain this data from our recreational anglers, how they would respond to different levels of quota and how many trips they might take. Uh, and so that's how we aggregate um, and create these curves. And generally, to, be, to really nail down where that optimum might be, you need to combine both of these sectors in a bioeconomic bio model so that their behavior uh, from data that you've collected is interacting with the stock and, and the size and age structure of the stock, ideally. So, you know, why are we doing this again? Back to this public good, private good uh, dilemma. Uh, there are rarely markets for public goods like fish or air. Uh, we have some pollution markets. We're starting to have catch shares in commercial fisheries, which are producing markets within a sector. Uh, I, I don't know of a single example where we have a, uh, a fully full-blown market between sectors uh, or across sectors. Um, and there's a recent trend to move towards markets in, in catch shares. Um, and there are many issues with this. Uh, personally, I'm on the commercial sector, I, I believe in catch shares, and I think they're mostly a good thing. Uh, but there's a lot of things I don't think we're doing correctly, and there's a lot of reasons I don't think they're appropriate for private recreational anglers. Um, first, my first problem is the public, you and me, are, we're rarely compensated for the use of this public uh, wealth. Um, on the recreational side, some are very philosophically, philosophically deeply philosophically opposed to privatization of, of wildlife uh, and fishery resources. And sort of it, it sort of flies in the face with our experience with US wildlife management in this country. 
Uh, and you hear the rec sector um, talk a lot about the U.S. fish and wildlife management model uh, and how successful it's been for conservation and restoring excellent hunting and fishing opportunities in the United States. And we don't manage that way uh, in the marine environment. Uh, but they do work. This slide got cut off a little bit. But by and large, these sorts of marketizations or, or privatization of, of a public resource work for commercial fisheries. They work by reducing capacity. Uh, they rationalize these fleets. Um, they make the commercial fishermen better off in general. There's some disagreement about the terms of what that all means, but in general, I think they've been a successful thing. So that's sort of my review uh, of sort of economic concepts that I'm going to use to talk about Red Snapper. I'm going to drill right into a case study on Red Snapper. There's a lot of other allocation battles that have been fought in the states. None of them ever resulted in any change in an allocation. Uh, but Red Snapper is one I've been working on a lot lately. And I think it sort of illustrates all of the pitfalls and problems that happen when we're trying to allocate without markets. Uh, so what are the problems? Why are we at this place where uh, the recreational sector is screaming for reallocation? Well, the original allocation was faulty. It was based on really old data uh, at a time, uh, really only on historical catch data, um, using the very first two years of MERS survey data, uh, which no one can locate the hard copy of that data any longer. Um, and it's not used in any stock assessments because it was generally considered to be sort of a test run. Um, and there was almost very little effort in the fishery at the time. The stock was in a very depleted state and there wasn't much activity. Uh, and so, but the stock is recovering now. Um, some would argue it's perhaps recovered. Um, and anglers respond to abundance. So we end up in this place where the anglers feel pinched. Uh, and I like to call this pinch the stock recovery trap. We have hard ACLs, uh, hard payback provisions in these fisheries, where any overage has to be paid back. The payback provisions just came into the fishery this last year, uh, but they're required by Magnuson. They were forced in by lawsuit. Um, and so because anglers respond to abundance, we have the stock is growing rapidly and recovering rapidly. CPUEs are going through the roof. We have you know, angling magazines saying red snapper fishing's never been better. We're catching red snapper in shore. We're catching red snapper from piers, uh, Tampa Bridge Skyway, which you never would have thought about catching a red snapper. They catch legal red snapper there all the time. And so we have a, a situation where anglers that aren't even targeting red snapper are catching red snapper. We have articles touting the abundance and, and the size and quality of the fishing for red snapper. All of this ha has the effect of increasing catch and increasing effort in the fishery. At the same time where we've got these strict tax and payback provisions. So you end up in this downward spiral of, you know, a year season, a half a year season, a 90 day season, uh, you know, a 15 day season, a nine day season. Uh, and I think last year was a nine day season. I think we're gonna, we didn't go over last year. Uh, I think we'll end up with a slightly larger season this season. If sector separation goes through and takes some of our fish away uh, and puts it in the for higher sector, I think what we're gonna end up seeing, if there's no relief, we're going to end up seeing this fishery yo-yo from open to closed, open to closed, open to closed um, because of these payback provisions and because of the uh, tightening down of quotas. Meanwhile, they keep sending the uh, uh, total allowable catch for the whole fishery through the roof. It's gone from 9 million to 11 million to now 13 million pounds. Some think it'll go to 15 million pounds when they include the new recreational data in the stock assessment model. Um, and so at the same time, the stock's getting better, and many people are arguing that it may be recovered and we should probably be letting more fish out. Well, they are letting more fish out. They keep increasing the harvest level. The recreational anglers keep blowing through that quota. And there's a catch here in the commercial fishery. And, uh, you know, why that is a problem is we, it's been really interesting working for the rec industry. I work for a lot of different sectors, uh, and I've worked for people on both sides of this debate, um, through this debate. and the, and. You know, five years ago, the rec sector was looked upon as the conservationists in the room. They were allied with the ocean conservancies and the Pew Oceans and, and EDF fighting for a better red snapper stock and fighting for better stocks. All of a sudden, a catch share comes along. We've seen this in every single one, every single mixed use fishery where a catch share has been instituted. The commercial guys are, get rationalized. They quit blowing through their tack. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're the, they're the good guys in the room. And the recre recreational guys start getting beat up. Um, and so that sort of conflict has sort of forced more focus and more attention on where the allocation is. But wait, there's more. Um, Magnuson calls for an examination of allocation. The last reauthorization had language in it regarding the use of economics uh, and the maximization of value in looking at allocation decision. 
tempered by saying you shouldn't use al economics solely to make a, an allocation decision. Um, the catch share policy, uh, NIMS catch share policy, says that thou shalt examine allocation and address allocation before you institute a catch share and address it or examine it uh, at least every five years thereafter. That has never been done. Uh, and that policy came out before the red snapper catch share was put in place. Um, they should have looked at that catch share before that initial allocation was made to quota holders. Because let me tell you, it's a whole lot easier before they get a permanent public right uh, that's now theirs to hold on to. And so, and uh, you also have the situation where these recreational anglers, particularly in the Gulf, are dealing with inshore fisheries that are predominantly recreational. But pretty much the states have recognized these values without an uh, allocation fight or an allocation examination. Uh, they realize they, they generate more value to have them as primarily recreational fisheries. And they've pretty much gotten rid of the commercial component in their inshore fisheries through straight up mandates that there will be no commercial fishing, through different gear bans. Uh, a lot of the net bans, there's a net ban in every state except for Mississippi now in the Gulf. And those net bans are pretty much ended inshore fishing for things like red drum, uh, uh, speckled trout, uh, snook, and some of those inshore species. Uh, so those are sort of de facto uh, recreational only species. Red drum is, a de fact, is, is a, one of those that was put in uh, by legislation in almost every state separately, except for Mississippi is the only state where you can still commercially land red drum in the Gulf. Um, and I think there's a big difference in, in how the states treat recreational anglers. They treat them like clients instead of regulated entities. And so uh, they realize where their value comes from, and their value comes from wallet bro money, which is excise, ta uh, excise taxes on fishing gear um, and sale of boats. And, 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 and ammunition, and also uh, license sales. So in some cases, 90 to 100% of these wildlife management agencies in these states that also handle their marine resources uh, are funded by recreational anglers, um, whereas commercial license sales are a drop in the bucket of their funding. Um, and so it's recreational anglers paying for all the infrastructure, uh, paying for the data collection, paying for the enforcement, paying for any stock assessment that happens at the state level, and they recognize that relationship. And so you have these anglers looking at a federal system going, why can't we get any traction when we get all this traction we want at the states? So before this recent round of papers, um, and my colleague Josh is going to pre uh, present next week, uh, we had a bunch of challenges. We tried to do this. We've been trying to change allocations. I've had my business now for a little over eight years. Uh, I worked for NIMS for about eight years. And we were looking at this issue and designing models and, and uh, sort of uh, trying to forecast the demand for these types of things. You know, wow, that's almost 16 years ago now we started looking at those things. They were looking at it before I came to work at NIMS. And so it's just now, we're just starting to do these modeling activities. We run into a lot of challenges, how to make our models better and get better data. It's, it's always in a quantitative situation. You're always looking for better data. Um, one of the challenges is councils are, are special interest driven beasts. Uh, they're designed to promote political capture uh, and, and, and promote rent seeking. Um, they're designed to generate conflicts of interest and encourage rent seeking and capture. Councils are primarily wealth redistribution bodies. Their principal responsibility by definition is converting public wealth into private wealth. That creates, that creates a very distinct opportunity for rent seeking. And rent seeking is when a, a group or a special interest is able to influence a body uh, to not go with a societal optimum, but to go with an optimum that lines their pockets uh, and generates rents. And I, I'm not accusing any one particular sector of that. I think you know recreational groups, conservation groups, and commercial groups are all guilty of this, and have all been variously successful or unsuccessful at doing this for the history of councils. Uh, and some really don't want to see successful allocate, uh, allocation mechanisms on all sides because they all think they're the better rent seekers. They all think they can win this game of lobbying better than the next guy. Um, this political capture, this rent seeking is very rampant and very difficult to overcome. And so the con consensus is difficult, particularly consensus that benefits all of us, the public and the owners of this resource. But formalizing a process is gonna help. Um, so if you only take action, you know, we need to be proactive. We need to be proactive in our use of economics. We need to be proactive in looking at allocation decisions. And I mean allocations writ large, allocation of everything, allocation of fish to conservation, allocation of fish to different sectors. And if you're only using economics when someone yells at you because you're supposed to use economics, or someone sues you because you didn't use economics, 
uh, you aren't doing a good job. You know, we need to be looking at these things when we design management structures and institutions. Uh, one concern is the analysis we always leave out to consumer, uh, the consumer of a seafood product. We're only looking at the producers. Uh, I, it doesn't really matter to me whether consumers are included. Uh, the reason being is U.S. consumers don't really care about seafood species. They care about price. And every single consumer demand survey that's ever been done for the willingness to pay of a consumer for a fillet of fish, uh, their cross-price elasticities and their, and their price elasticities for that individual species are very small and very inelastic. They don't really care so much, which means that their willingness to pay are very small. Um, you know, on a red snapper fillet, the last time I saw someone do some demand analysis, currently red snapper sells for the mid 20s to $30 a pound in Whole Foods, Gulf Red Snapper. The, the willingness to pay attached to buying that fillet is in the 20 to 30 cent range. Um, and so when we're talking, when we look at some of the graphs that actually come out of the red snapper allocation fight, we're not talking about much to add there. And when it is added, it rarely changes the conclusion. We have some fairness and equity concerns. You know, is it okay to take something from someone else? You know, they've been using it, even though it's better for society and even though it's a public resource, is that fair? Is that equitable? Uh, should they only be compensated changes in allocation? Which you'll hear Josh Abbott argue next week that the only way you should be dealing with allocation is if the person you're taking it from is compensated for it. But as a result of all of these old challenges, the doors of allocation were already rusted shut. Um, but we begin to make some progress. So the new challenges, well, we come back to data uncertainty. We always keep battling this data uncertainty. Uh, we've also found that point estimates are not enough. If you just make point estimates, the shape of those curves matters a lot, right? So if you're looking at uh, where those things intersect, whether one's vertical or one's horizontal, can make a very big difference. Um, and so even if point estimates are very far apart, we find economists who review this information and this research very reluctant to recommend a change. They'll say, yep, it's inefficient, but we're not sure where it needs to go, so we shouldn't do it. And so we've realized that we need to trace out these entire functions. We need to estimate bioeconomic models. We get a lot of criticism for hypothetical angular data, because there's only two ways to trace out that function. One is by giving anglers log books, which are very difficult to get filled out and have any repeatability and, and panel retention. And uh, anybody who's done any panel data collection knows what a terrible, difficult thing that is to do. Uh, so we do state of preference choice experiments, or, or what we call conjoint surveys. Uh, they have a long history of, of looking at behavior across multiple attributes and multiple variables of those attributes. But people say, well, yeah, this is all well and good. Our number, you know, these are the commercial guys speaking, our number comes from the market, your number comes from thin air. Uh, and so that's you know, a legitimate concern we have to deal with and think about. So the new tack, the, the one that uh, my colleague next week will talk about, is this idea of intersectoral uh, allocative efficiency. That's the, inner, that's the allocated the efficiency of the allocation within the individual sector. Uh, Rationalization in the commercial fleet and a catch here in the commercial fleet means their allocation is efficient. That, that next pound of quota goes to the commercial fisherman that's willing to pay the most for it. And that's what we mean. You know, that's, that is an efficient allocation. That that schedule of different values of quota, because everybody has a different willingness to pay for that quota. Uh, some guys aren't very good at fishing and can't afford to rent that quota or pay for that quota very highly. Uh, to be able to make money. Other guys are very efficient and are willing to pay much more for that quota because they, they have lower costs and can afford a higher cost in their quota purchase. Um, and so that arises this complaint, which you will hear uh, Josh say, or he definitely says in his paper, I can't predict what he's going to say in his presentation, that the only way to do this is through the marketplace. Um, and then we have groups uh, sort of tacking onto that. Um, and, and this is definitely the EDF agenda, uh, uh, which I couldn't disagree with more, is the only way to fix red snapper is limited entry. The only way we're going to be able to do any sort of allocation is privatization, and also beyond privatization, uh, limited entry into the uh, recreational red snapper fishery. But what's, what's really going on? What are they really talking about? What do they really mean? Well, these are sort of two questions. One is a, a scientific issue, that's uncertainty. Uh, one's a philosophical issue about property rights. Um, uncertainty's not new to any of us. Anybody who's done any stock assessment work, anybody who's done any analysis that ends up going, uh, being used for management purposes, you're very transparent about your uncertainty. You know, we know that this, you know, we've got a point estimate here, a graph here, but we know that 
through the data construction process or because of our experiment or because of whatever we did, there's some uncertainty with that data. And then certainty can take all sorts of forms. Um, and so I'm going to talk more about this uncertainty in the, in the intersectoral uh, allocative efficiency because that's sort of, that's the big one we're, we're facing right now. Um, but we do this, you know, when we do a stock assessment, we set ACLs, we're, we're acting on uncertain data all of the time. And again, that's back to the gist of my paper is we can't sit here and say, well, we could do better, so we shouldn't make a decision. Uh, if we did that with stock assessments, we'd never do anything. Um, you know, there's some species, you know, we were talking about, well, uh, we, we, if we set the tack here, we've got, you know, a 25%, and we set the tack here, we got a 75%, and set the tack here, we got an 85% level of success. And that transparency is right up, I mean, that uncertainty is right up front. And they make decisions, and sometimes they go with a low probability catch uh, uh, ACL for sort of rebuilding and that sort of thing. And so we deal with this sort of thing all the time. Uh, we know some allocations are wrong, and we know some allocations are very wrong. Um, so we need to deal with this uncertainty and move forward. And allocations need to be addressed. We have statutes that say so. We have NIMFS uh, policy that says so. We have economics that says so. Um, and I think even though we don't have an organic act in fisheries like we do for a lot of our other public resources that demand the maximization of value, we do have some language in Magnuson that we need to pay attention to value. And I think as managers, we owe it to the public uh, to be getting the maximum value out of our resource use. Who's ever using that resource? So where are we right now with Red Snapper? Well, we've got a peer-reviewed study. It's actually been peer-reviewed, oh geez, now almost four times. It gets, keeps getting kicked back to the SCSSC at the Gulf. They say, yep, this looks good. Yep, this is inefficient. We don't know what to go, where to go, where to move to. And the council says, yeah, we don't like that answer. Review it again. Um, and that's happened now three times, kind of four times. So what we've got a study that says the same thing every time. Recreational willingness to pay is about 11.21 a pound. Commercial willingness to pay is about 2.75 a pound. You don't see any demand curves here, quota demand curves here, because they haven't estimated them. We've got an excellent size structured stock model of the Red Snapper stock. We've got exactly the kind of data on the recreational side you need to link to a, a uh, the bio model, make a beautiful bioeconomic model. Uh, it's, it's always easy to hook up the uh, commercial sector. And we could trace out those functions. NIMFS won't do it. I'm not really sure why they won't do it. And so we keep kicking these point estimates around. Um, and so that's a, that's a wide gulf. It's really hard for me to sort of envision the kind of levels of uncertainty, whether it's data uncertainty or allocative efficiency uncertainty, that would close that gap. Um, it's really difficult for me. And we, we have Amendment 28 in front of the council right now that keeps getting, the, it's the can that keeps getting kicked down the road. But the preferred choice in that amendment is an allocation of only increases, 75% increases to the recreational sector, 25% to the commercial sector. And at the current TAC level, it's about a 4% change in allocation. So we'd go from a 51% commercial, 49% recreational to about a 54% recreational, 46% commercial. Uh, but the commercial sector wouldn't lose any pounds. They'd still be at the same number of pounds. Uh, the recreational guys, actually, they'd be 25% higher than their current, uh, well, 25% of the increase would go to them. Um, and so they get more fish. The recreational sector gets proportionally more fish, and they're still stopping it. Um, not so much stopping it as not taking any action. So uh, I'm going to have to speed up here again. So let's, let's talk about, let's say this is Red Snapper again. We haven't estimated these functions. But what if, what if this is what these functions look like? What if, you know, I, this is going to come back to bite me. I know it. Uh, you know, this star is awful close to 100%. Let's say it's not. Let's say it's 80. Um, it's just these are the hypothetical, hypothetical internet. Um, so say we have data uncertainty. We know how to handle that. Let's say we're 100% certain on the, on the commercial side, which we are pretty close because we're using market values. Uh, but so we have uncertainty. So we put some error bars on it. We're still not anywhere near where we currently are. This 50% allocation and, and the quota demand price of about almost $3, 275 ish 
So that suggests to me we should move. That graph suggests to me that a 4% shift in allocation is warranted. Um, and all the economic economists have reviewed that analysis to say, yep, it's inefficient. But with point estimates, we don't know how far to move it. So what is intersectoral allocative efficiency? We're going to move on to that next. Uh, maximizing efficiency requires that those with a higher valuation receive those next fish. So if the recreational sector were to get 4% more fish, well, that guy with the highest willingness to pay for that next fish would get that first one. And the guy with the next highest willingness to pay for that fish would get the second one. And the, and the gal with the third highest willingness to pay would get that third fish or pound of fish and so on and so forth. That is intersectoral allocative efficiency. But that quota is going to those that value it the most. So what's the problem? You know, if, the problem is if you believe that there's a, a catch function or, or, or a harvest generating regime in the recreational angling community and their demand for these fish and the way they access this fish, if those fish go to lower valued users first, then society's not realizing a higher value. That that actual higher value we're predicting never happened. That's valid. That works. Uh, Abbott argues the only way to address this is with markets. I disagree because it's just any other sort of uncertainty. Um, and so here we're back to this question. One's a scientific question, one's a philosophical question. The Holzer and McConnell paper, which Abbott will probably talk about, and some of you may have read, the recent paper that talks about this idea of expected utility. You've, you've measured this value, but because of inefficiencies in, in the intersectoral allocation and how those fish are distributed, that realized value or expected value may be lower than that. I'll also show you in a second, it could also be higher than that, but he never mentions that in the paper. Uh, and then one of the philosophical question, and that's the Abbott paper, that the only way into this, the only way to fix this is through a market. Well, that is one way to fix it, but there's a lot of questions. Is it okay to privatize resources in general? Is it okay to treat anglers like businesses? Uh, is there a need for limited entry, or do we need to just address angler management different than the way we address commercial management? Uh, and I would argue uh, that that's the case, that we, we, we need to quit fishing hard tax for recreational guys. Uh, we don't inshore. We don't in fresh water. We manage to an F, uh, manage to a mortality rate, not an absolute extraction number. Uh, and, and, there, and there's a lot more sort of certainty in the way you can estimate that than trying to estimate hard uh, harvest. So I want to talk a little bit about this intersectoral allocative efficiency. So here we've got a normal distribution. Pick a distribution, I don't care. Uh, we tend to use normal. Uh, so the mean, we have a mean willingness to pay from the recreational sector up here at the top of 1121. Who's had statistics? Who's had basic statistics? So everybody in this room knows or just about everybody, either that or you're being lazy or asleep, uh, I saw most hands go up, that everybody on this side has a higher willingness to pay than 1121. And everyone from here over has a lower willingness to pay. So what holes are suggesting is that we can't reallocate, or we need to take into advantage, uh, take into account this expected value if we believe there's some reason that these guys are going to catch those new fish first. And then Abbott then argues that since we can't control this, and since the only way to control that allocation efficiency is through a market, we can't do anything until we have a market. But I want you to think for a second about how these models are derived. These models are derived using a random sample of angle, angler trips. That random sample of angler trips embodies the process by which willingness to pay is distributed through the angling population. This distribution captures that whole thing. And so unless you believe that their harvest, the way they harvest fish is going to be different than the way we watch them harvest fish, then it doesn't matter. And it's just as easy to believe that guys in this tail, if willingness to pay is linked with the ability to buy a faster, more expensive boat, uh, or those with more leisure time with faster expensive boats, aren't going to race out there and catch those more fish, that expected value may actually be higher than the graph we've shown. But Holzer won't, doesn't publish that. He talks about sort of the fact that it could be lower. It could be anything. The point is, we can measure this, and we can account for this. It's not difficult. We have data actually right now we could query and say, what type, 
what types of people are associated with what types of willingness to pay? And how are their trip-taking behaviors? And we can figure out a dist distribution of this expected value uh, instead of just measuring the <coughs> exact value. And so what does that mean? Well, here's our, so here's our graph again. This is the data uncertainty. Let's call this expected value this time, just for giggles, right? And so we have, a, you know, expected value could be a little higher, could be a little lower. There's still a huge gulf here. In fact, you'd have to, that generation process, that allocative process that allocates those fish to anglers would have to be that much different to change the conclusion. It's really hard to imagine in the case of red snapper that it would be that much different. And in fact, I have examples. I've worked in summer flounder doing allocation, uh, and it's a perfect example of quantitatively estimating this, coming up with a decision that's too close to call. And so you temper that with fairness and equity. You temper that with uncertainty. You temper that with allocative inefficiency, uh, data uncertainty. And the council said, this is too close to call. These two point estimates are too close together. We either need to draw these curves out or we need to not make any changes. And so they're not, they didn't make any changes, but they're in the process of drawing those two curves out. Uh, and had a very similar situation in the scup fishery. Built a beautiful bioeconomic model in a nothing burger fishery. We figured it was a perfect example of where to change some allocations because nobody really cared. We've got a price of zero or nearly zero in the commercial sector during landing gluts in the summertime. We've got a recreational sector that wants more fish. We're like, this is perfect. We can put a quantitative model to the test in a situation where we know from the marketplace that the, the quota demand on the commercial side is darn near zero. Uh, we built this beautiful model. We showed that we need to change allocation. And about four months before we finished and finalized the model, the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council doubled the TAC. Um, and our bioeconomic model said, nobody's going to catch their TAC. And sure enough, the next year, nobody caught their TAC. So we didn't change any allocations. We didn't need to. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm not. Nobody is saying that you come up with this star on the graph right here and say, well, yep, 95% is going to go to the wreck guys. Um, we know that's not the case. Magnuson says we can't just use economics. We know there's equity and fairness uh, issues to temper these decisions. Um, and we know there's these problems with allocative efficiency. So EDF has been very active uh, in catch shares institutions. Um, and in Red Snapper, they have uh, instituted a, a commercial um, catch share. And through their direct lobbying efforts and through the lobbying efforts of the Gulf Shareholders Alliance, uh, they have stopped Amendment 28, um, this amendment to reallocate Red Snapper that's been in play for, boy, more than two years now. Uh, the amendment keeps getting kicked back down to the S SSC for socioeconomics. They keep kicking it back up saying, Yes, it's inefficient, but we can't tell you where to move it to. Um, and, and currently, there's a circular argument going on that I think is very interesting. Uh, they say point estimates can't be used for marginal changes, um, can only be used for marginal changes. So you know, when, you know, anyone who's done any econometrics or estimation of anything, once you move past the current state too far, that data may not be valid anymore. Um, and so what the, that's, that's their argument. And they're right. Uh, but what is marginal? Is 4% is marginal? Is 4%? That's what we're talking about right now. That's a preferred term, alternative is about a four and a quarter percent allocation change. Is that too much? Is, is that, is that non-marginal? Is that so far away, so such a big movement that it's going to close that gap between 275 and 11 and a quarter? I don't think so. But at the same time, EDF is say, saying that. They're also saying, we shouldn't change allocation a marginal amount because it's not going to fix anything. You know, we move only 4% allocation. It's going to give the anglers maybe one more day, maybe two more days, three more days tops um, from a nine day to a 12 day season. That doesn't fix anything. That's, you know, that's just a drop in the bucket. So they say, don't do anything. Uh, we need limited entry before we can even talk about this. Um, and so this is, this is in essence the sort of what political capture is. We've got this strangely circular argument going on um, that's not allowing allocation to move. Um, and and it's, it's, it's maddening. So I love markets. I love market reforms. I like catch shares. Um, you know, they're really good at eliminating excess capacity 
and getting rid of boats and right-sizing the fishery, because that's what they do. Um, you know, you're going to lose 30 to 60 percent of your capacity, like, overnight. Um, they're really good at handing public natural resource wealth to private citizens for zero compensation. Uh, it's a little bit sarcastic there. I don't know if you picked up on that. Um, and they're good at turning the fishermen that stay into the fisheries into millionaires that generally lease their quota out and no longer fish. Um, to some cases, they've destroyed the share system and are now paying captains an hourly wage or, or a flat rate to run their uh, trips and, and uh, lease their quota. Um, and the, very, the jury's very much still out on whether or not there are stock gains uh, or sustainability gains to catch shares. Uh, some fisheries it seems like there might be, some fisheries it doesn't seem like there are. Um, but rationalization is important. Eliminating overcapacity is a good thing. Uh, you know, turning these guys into professional fishermen, I think, is a, is a good societal goal. Um, but recreational fishing is about opportunity. It has sort of different drivers. The value creation process in recreational fishing um, has more to do with than just harvest. It's about opportunity. It's about the uh, opportunity to get out on the water and encounter lots of fish, uh, lots of big fish, generally. Um, notice I didn't say harvest lots of fish. Uh, nowhere is this included in the model because we don't really know how to assign those values to a single species for a guy going out on the water. Uh, there are tons of values that recreational fishing generates that are not being captured in this allocation analysis because we tend to just look at what the commercial fishery produces and that's dead fish. Uh, there's a lot of goods that are produced not by dead fish in the fishing process. And by going into limited entry and, and following these sort of pathways, we're destroying value in that fishery. Uh, and if we have to because of sustainability issues, that's fine. That's what we should do. But I don't think that's the case. Uh, I know that's not the case. Um, there isn't such a thing as recreational excess capacity. And you make an individual catch share, and you do limited entry in a recreational fishery, you're going to end up getting rid of a lot of anglers. They're going to quit fishing. They're going to switch to something else. Um, so why is this? Why, you know, why does privatizing these resources um, uh, destroy the value of production of trees? Well, the, the large thing is, is transactions cost and the very nature of property rights. First, property rights just eliminate capacity. Beyond the transactions cost issue, let's take that aside for a second. <sighs> People won't be willing to pay what the market's asking, and so those people will fall out. That's what happens in commercial fisheries. The, the value of being paid to quit fishing is worth more to them in value than staying in fishing. So immediately we have a shrinking of the recreational population. Next there will be a shrinking in participation due to transactions costs. You're going to have individuals, and we talked a lot about this today in various groups, you're trying to participate in a market that deals in thousands of pounds of quota. And you got a guy that's like, I want to go fishing this weekend. I think I should pick up 20 pounds of quota. How's he going to buy that? You know, how's he going to be able to transact in a market and be able to get a fair price for a couple pounds of quota? Or maybe he's foresightful enough to purchase all the quota he needs for a year. We're still talking about a couple hundred pounds of quota. And we're still talking about a guy who's not a businessman, who's not motivated to go pursue the best price, to participate in a market. And these are what we call transactions costs. They're the cost and opportunity to this guy, uh, the cost of participating in this market that aren't borne out by the cost of the quota itself. And what that does is it drives up the price beyond what the market clearing price would normally be, and therefore drives out, it, it eliminates an efficient equilibrium, and it drives out effort. And that's what we'd see in recreational fisheries. Now there's some ways around that. There's some ways to introduce some market things without completely destroying the value creation process. But, you know, the next thing we have is I, we have a guy that sits around in his cubicle all day, five days a week, or driving his forklift down at the warehouse. All he can think about is getting out on Saturday and catching some red snapper or going fishing in general. And it's about that opportunity, his participation, his investment in his boat, his buying of gas, his what is driving value in recreational fishing has nothing to do whether or not he kills his two red snapper on Saturday. Uh, some of it does, but a very small portion of that. Um, and so that's something, you know, he'll, he'll go out there and generate value fishing under very constrained situations. 
under very small bag limits, under very large size limits, under very short seasons, which is what we're seeing, because his value is not exclusively tied to harvest. And so we have a disconnect there. And so our estimates of value we're using these allocation analysis, we're in sort of a least most situation, uh, which is the way, you know, read some publications on allocation and how we've done this equal marginal things in the past. We make assumptions on the rec sector that are decreasing, that end up being the lower limit on their value. A lot of times just for technical reasons, because we can't measure the upper limit on their value. And on the commercial side, we tend to go the opposite direction. We tend to be making assumptions that tend to put them at the upper end of their value. Or at least more accurately, with now that we're in the catch share situation, we from the marketplace have a really good idea what their value is. Um, and this is borne out in inshore, in freshwater, uh, where we don't have commercial fisheries anymore in freshwater, besides a little bit of uh, yellow perch in the Great Lakes and some catfish in the south. Uh, there's still some wild caught catfish on the south, not a lot. Um, but we've predominantly gone to recreational fisheries because we understand that that, that value can be higher in some fisheries. Um, and we know as a recreational community, no, we're not going to win this allocation fight. We don't demand more fish in every fishery we participate in. And we have an issue where the councils and nymphs have struggled so much with sort of getting a handle on commercial fishing. They finally think they've got it right, but that's all they really know how to do. Um, I don't think they really understand the value generation process. I don't think they understand how to man manage recreational fishing. And I think that rate-based management, getting away from setting recreational ACLs and pounds is, is a really good step. And I think that NIMS agrees with that. I think that you know the, the recent reforms being proposed for National Standards 1, 3, and 7 that just came out a couple weeks ago reflect that and actually state that uh, you could set an ACL in, in, in an F rather than total pounds. Uh, and the recreational fishery policy that came out this fall out of NIMS basically echoes that, uh, that we need to think about how we manage recreational fishing differently than how we manage commercial fishing. And this accountability fiction, I'm, I'm really pissed off about the word accountability being thrown at me or, or thrown at the recreational community in council meetings. Uh, these guys, by and large, catch their bag limit and no more. They catch fish that are legal to the size. Um, you know, there is poaching, but it's not rampant. Uh, and so what are we talking about accountability? How can we be more accountable? On a trip-by-trip -trip basis, these guys are being accountable. You can't have 100% catch accounting. It's impossible with a recreational fishery. Absolutely impossible. You can't ratchet up funding for the MRIP survey high enough to get 100% catch accounting. You can't require every fish to be landed at a dock somewhere. It's just impossible. Uh, not like deer counts or, or deer tags. So what are we doing? Uh, we have a survey, the MRFs, that the National Science Foundation says you can't use this for in-season quota monitoring. What are we doing with it? We're trying to monitor an in, a quota in-season. Uh, that survey is based on a two-month wave. It's based on producing efficient and, and uh, low variance estimates annually. Currently, we're trying to use that to manage a nine-day season. So much of the closure decision on that nine-day season could be completely variance. Uh, could be that we just missed the catch estimate because we didn't, catch, we didn't collect data over a long enough period of time. We didn't use the survey within the parameters at which it was designed. And yet we're currently being hammered on this. We're currently being told that this is our accountability problem. It's not. It's a management institution problem. We're using the wrong institution to manage this fishery. We're using the wrong institution to manage every recreational fishery. Um, and Josh Abbott next week is going to argue the only institution that works is the market. And I disagree with him. Uh, but there's some movement. And so I'm almost done. I think I'm out of time, but I think I can clear these last couple of slides really quick. Uh, we got to have top-down allocation. We found that out with ACLs. We had councils setting ACLs and tax uh, willy-nilly, way above the scientific recommendation. It took top-down guidance to make that change. It took top-down guidance to get hard rebuilding schedules. I don't think we'll ever see allocations change through the political process uh, without some top-down guidance. You'll do these sorts of models. You'll deal with this kind of uncertainty. And you know we'll talk about all the mitigating factors. And we'll be transparent about it and set an allocation. Um, go ahead and estimate stuff. We have tons and tons and tons and tons of data. It doesn't get used, particularly in the rec sector. We have so much recreational data and behavioral data on the rec sector. You know, this question, I love Holzer's theoretical paper. It's a great theoretical paper. Uh, 
But he could have tested that with data. You know, we've got data to answer that question. What is allocative efficiency? How is allocative efficiency working out, frankly? Uh, we could have tested that. We should be testing that. We need to move forward with stuff like that. Um, and get rid of this idea of 100% accounting. It's just not going to work. We can't do it. And so it's impossible to hold a recreational community to a standard that's a possible or, or completely economically inefficient to, to attain. And so, you know, I say markets aren't appropriate for the recreational sector, but I think markets could be very appropriate for handling this intersectoral allocation. Um, and I think if you didn't assign individual quota to an angler, but assigned it to a management body, either the state or a club or like a community development quota, quota we know how to do this in the commercial sector. Um, there's actually a proposal in front of the halibut commission right now to do that for, for higher anglers in the halibut fishery where they're given a certain level of quota uh, to an to a organization, and that organization can then trade with the commercial sector on behalf of that organization. Within that organization, they can decide how they distribute that. They can distribute as tags, they can distribute as individual quota, they can manage it as a pooled quota within the halibut fishery. Uh, something like that could work probably very well. I think the rec sector is very opposed to that still, but uh, it would answer this allocation decision immediately. Uh, in fact, there's a, a bioeconomic model that was generated in the early 2000s under a Marfin grant by some uh, really good scientists at Texas A&M University. Uh, they did a uh, simulated market for red snapper allocation, and their simulation showed that you know, the recreational sector would buy out all of the red snapper quota. And they also ran a little uh, uh, funny simulation that for red snapper fishing, if shrimp was under quota, we'd buy out most of the shrimp fishery and not fish it, uh, because that's the biggest source of mortality for red snapper. Uh, still. Um, so if you believe that opportunity and not just harvest generates value, and I think it does, uh, you have to resist this individual recreational fishing rights uh, and reallocate stocks based on science. We need to quit allowing the perfect to be the enemy of the good. We don't do it in any other science. We don't do it in any other thing in fisheries management. We have tons of uncertainty every time we make a decision. We're just transparent about that uncertainty and we move forward. And this idea of allocation efficiency, I have one more point to make and then I'm done. If, if we take this idea of uh, intersectoral allocation efficiency to the end, and, and we have several people saying we shouldn't do anything until we figure this out, we pretty much have to throw any benefit cost analysis we've ever done out if that benefit cost analysis involves the allocation of a public good. Because anything that's a market value, I mean, a, a non-market value derived for a public good that doesn't have a market that's been included in a benefit cost decision to advocate for some conservation move or any change at all, if you believe that their point is true, uh, or you believe that, that there is a problem with allocative efficiency, those value estimates are no longer positive, are no longer in favor of those changes. So this is a good point. It's a good theoretical point. But we as a society have, have made many decisions based on the value of saving the species is much higher than harvesting more of that species. Um, and if that species hasn't been traded in a market, this same complaint arises. So, you know, which is it? You know, are we, are we going to get past that? Are we going to do what we've always done with benefit cost uh, analysis and using value in our decisions? Or are we going to rewrite those rules and say, wait a minute, unless there's a market there, we can't make a decision? Uh, that's all I've got for you guys. I'm, I'm definitely an advocate of that. And, and the question was, uh, have, what is our sort of position uh, on, on adaptive management? And has adaptive management been brought up as a tool for this? It has been brought up. Uh, the, the council, that makes the council very uncomfortable. Uh, it is used in other resource uses all the time. Um, and uh, basically, I've got a paper with Eli Finical and um, uh, Robert Arlinghouse about sort of decision support functions and the construction of those being an iterative process, where, uh, which I think would be wonderful for allocation. 
if, and if I was king and giving top-down guidance to the councils, I would say, okay, we built, we built an allocation function that's composed of these quantitative and non-quantitative factors that we've, and we've done some scoring algorithm on. Uh, let's put some numbers in here and see what happens. And a year later, let's put the new numbers in and see what happens. And I think you know, that would be a really good way to go. If we could get all of these constituents to sit down in a room, and stakeholders to sit down in a room and hammer out what that function should look like, and what they want that function to look like, what they want weighted. If equity is weighted so high that we never change allocation, well, so be it, you know, if the stakeholders decide that. Uh, but revisit that decision periodically. And I think if you formalize a process to do that, it would be the, the, the process to develop that would be very burdensome uh, and very contentious. But once you had something in there that said this is, th this is what we're going to do and this is binding, revisiting that would not be as contentious. Uh, and that's been, I think that's been the experience with adaptive management other places it's been changed. And the, the very act of building these functions tends to solve a lot of conflict, uh, has been my experience working with sort of adaptive management and building these scoring functions and, and uh, benefit functions uh, for making natural resource management decisions. It's been done in a lot of um, river type issues and, and freshwater fisheries issues and freshwater habitat issues that I've been involved in. And just bringing you know, the farmers and the ranchers and the fishermen and the uh, road builders and, and the home builders and all these guys into a room to sort of talk about what's important to them, it turns out they all have very similar ideas of what's important to them. Um, they get away from sort of this contentious environment of a council. Uh, so yeah, I think, it, I think there's promise there. Nobody's talking about it really yet, except sort of in, in published papers. Uh, the, the question is, uh, do, does a spatial dynamic matter in the valuation uh, of fish and, and does the sort of place matter? I think the short answer is yes. It, it can matter a lot for some particular fisheries. Uh, the trouble is we, we've, we've barely got to the point where we can estimate these values not attached to place for recreational fishing. Uh, we've tried. I think there's a, a new wave coming in the future. Um, and I, uh, well, two things. I think. You know, we've, we've in, the, in the MRF survey, I've been involved with the MRF survey, now the MRIP survey, for a very long period of time. And we've tried to do some on-water location choice data collections, but using maps, showing people point to where you fished. It's worthless, almost worse than worthless. You spend a lot more interviewer time, and no one knows where they went. Or if they didn't know where they went, they're very specific about it. I went here for 15 minutes, and there for 15 minutes, and down here. And it's like, OK, how do you use that information? And they can't attach those points in space to catch. But that said, that's why it hasn't been done. We're now coming upon this era of the smartphone. And there's now uh, several applications in the Gulf and, and uh, South Atlantic where they're using these tools for fishery data collection. Uh, there's a lot of issues to deal with that. It's self-selected data. It's not a random data generation process. That causes problems. It's not a deal breaker. Uh, I think for behavioral data, there's a whole lot less problems than using them for catch data. Uh, but anglers love them. Um, and you know, one of the programs is iSnapper. I think it's uh, Heart Research Institute put that out with some uh, EDF money, I think. Uh, but it's been widely embraced by the entire recreational community, regardless of who paid for it. Uh, it's used quite frequently. We've there's been some discussions about uh, adding on economics modules so that you could then estimate these values, you know, based on distance. And there's been some proposals actually. Um, to sort of to sort of end this conflict, say okay, commercial guys, you get the fish outside of X fathoms, and rec guys, you get the fish inside of X fathoms, and we'll quit worrying about allocation. We'll set the tack and we'll fish, and they think that this spatial uh, drawing a spatial line might be all that it would take, um, because those those fish, you know, 30 miles out are worth almost nothing to rec guys because they got to travel so far to get them. And that takes pressure off the inshore fish that didn't used to exist, but now they're catching, you know, the states are blowing through their quota. That's another thing in red snapper fisheries. The states have all gone non-compliant as of last year. They basically told the feds, screw you guys, we're going to catch what we want. And Louisiana has gone to a weekends only season year round uh, instead of a nine day season. And so what, what we're dealing with now is a very short federal season outside of three miles or outside of nine miles in Florida 
that season's so short because so much of the fish are being caught outside of the season. The state's being non-compliant because they've said we don't. This is pure fiction how you're managing us, and we're tired of it. And so there's been talk of preemption, which is rarely done by the federal government, but they could come in and say, close the entire fishery and penalize the states and preempt them because they think that the federal law is being broken. Uh, it is being broken. Uh, the fact of the matter is, though, it's not hurting the stock, so they don't have a real strong case for preemption. But anyway, so there are some spatial things being considered, and I think, I think it bears uh, consideration. I think our data is lagging at the moment to be able to make decisions like that. And I think you've seen sort of spatially made allocation decisions. Um, you know, the Dungeness Crab reallocation that just happened this last year um, in Washington State. Uh, or last year, last two years, the recreational guys got a huge share, but only in close end waters, right? And so they took that out of um, basically closed some, my understanding. But anyway, it's sort of a spatially generated reallocation. And the new gillnet ban in the low uh, main stem of the Columbia is a spatial allocation question. Um, they didn't change salmon allocations writ large, but they believe the value to recreational anglers to be very high in these areas that are easy for them to access. So they reduced commercial catch in those areas. 